Hello there. Today, I would like to talk about one of my semi-frequently asked questions. This came up in an email that I just looked at this morning, and it comes up every few months or so. Somebody asks me a question along these lines, and the question goes like this. The person recounts a sometimes they'll they'll describe it as an awakening experience or an enlightenment experience or ken show or or some sort of thing like that and then sometimes they fill me in with a lot of unnecessary details about what happened and all the sparkly things they saw and when we get around to what the actual question is the question is all my friends are acting weird around me now what should I do about that? So this is a this is a good question, and it's a question that a lot of us who do this sort of practice come up against. And I uh, wrote about uh, this big experience that happened to me in two of my books, in Hardcore Zen and in um, uh, There Is No God and He Is Always With You. And I've written about it in the internet, and it's people people who follow me have a name for it. They go, your bridge experience. This thing that happened to me when I was crossing a bridge in Tokyo and on my way to work, and I had this kind of experience of like, whoa, everything changed. That, uh, every time I try to address it, it comes out wrong. And so I want you to understand, for one thing, when you read those books and when you listen to me talk about it, it coming it's coming out wrong and that could be one of the problems here uh, it, it might get right to the heart of the problem is how deeply misunderstood my writings about this are as an example of how this usually goes and in my case this this thing that happened on the bridge was the culmination, I suppose, culmination kind of gives it too much weight, of a process that had begun, you know, 20 or 25 years before when I first started doing Zazen, and had kind of started to coalesce over a period of about a year, I'm guessing. You know, there were, there were weird things happening constantly and and changes and and I can recall some of them and and at the time they seemed really exciting and new and now they've kind of been incorporated as part of my life when I first started to express some of these things I did I think what what you might do in this case because there were other people uh, who were Nishijima Roshi's students and they uh, they seemed to be the kind of people who might understand this so I tried talking to some of them about it and the reactions I got were very negative like really strongly negative I seemed to touch something that made people angry uh, and and I don't know why and to this day I don't really understand the reaction I got but the reaction I got was something like I was bragging or I was lying or or, or something like that and uh, total misunderstanding so I very quickly decided I'm not gonna talk to these people about this anymore and and I stopped and I was also a working person I was working for Tsuburaya Productions in the international division so I'm surrounded by people every day and I had a normal sort of nine to five job that was actually a ten to six job I couldn't talk to anybody there about it but a few things would would come up here and there because I, I was noticing that the way I and pretty much everyone I'd ever encountered had understood the world was completely wrong. And I wasn't really trying to correct them, but I was coming from a different place. And and some of the things I said would just be taken weirdly. I remember one incident, and I might have mentioned this on a video before I can't remember so forgive me if I already have but I was in a work meeting and something had gone terribly wrong and it was my fault and it was it something to do with pencils but we don't even go into this it was these Ultraman pencils but somebody asked me my boss at Sushi Saito asked me you know, why why did this happen and or, or why didn't you notice this before and I said something like well the the situation hadn't 
arrived at that point yet <laughs> which was which was like a really buddhist way of of saying things and it was sincere but it seemed to him like i was trying to defer responsibility or, or trying to not take responsibility for for having messed this up but i was just trying to express that there was no way to know this thing was going to go wrong until it went wrong that's that's sometimes how it is in life you know you you think you're doing the right thing and then suddenly you go oh wow that was not the right thing and and then you you scramble to to fix it and that's just how it goes but in normal society what you're supposed to do is go i'm sorry i really messed up and you know and and bow and scrape and stuff so the I don't know if there's a great answer I can give you for how to deal with these things, but I think what I deferred to or defaulted to or, or just kind of came around to was just pretending. Uh, I, I knew the act because I'd done it for, you know, who knows how long, how many lifetimes, who knows. I mean, we can talk about past lives and stuff if you want, but I don't really want to talk about it. But I'd done it for at least this entire lifetime. I had played this game that, that other people were playing. And I could still play it. It wasn't, it wasn't like I'd lost my ability to play it. I was just seeing through it. So I thought, well, okay, the only way to kind of have a normal relationship with people is to, is to play the game. And, and if I met somebody who seemed like they were interested in finding a way out of the game, I could kind of test the waters by saying a couple of things and, and seeing how they reacted and see if they really want to go there with me or not. Most of the time they didn't. So I backed off. You know, and eventually I got into this position of being a teacher of this stuff, which is something I've also written about that Nishijima Roshi kind of forced me into. He kind of he kind of did this thing where he called me to his his office and I sat there and I talked to him and he said, you know, I'm getting very tired of doing these lectures in English all the time. Would you mind taking over? You know, knowing that I really can't say no to a pitch like that. If he'd kind of if he'd done it a different way, I could have said no. But he's he's asking me for help, and so what am I supposed to do, right? So he put me in this position where I had to be the teacher, and that got me into a position where I am now, as a regular part of my life, meeting people who are interested in finding a way out of the game, you know, out of the game of, of what we've been playing as human beings for the past, you know, several thousand years, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, long time anyway. And so there's a, there's a language that I can speak uh, to that, but I, I still see how it it kind of goes cattywampus all the time. I, I see it with these videos and I see some of the comments that come up and I go, oh, yeah, I kind of am doing that again. I'm, I'm saying the thing that triggers the person. And, and there's all sorts of issues that, that come up. You, you wouldn't think that people who meditate regularly would be prone to jealousy and angry anger and rivalry and, and this kind of stuff, but they definitely are. And especially in Nishijima Roshi's group, there were a few people in there who were jockeying for position because they thought there was a position to be had and they were trying to get it and then they were accusing me of, of backstabbing them or, or something like that or ass kissing. Uh, what was the word? Uh, I, I, um, oh God. Lick spittle. That was it. Lick spittle. And I had to look that up because it was a British person who said this to me. Lick spittle is a British version of ass kisser. In America, you say ass kisser. In, in Britain, they say lick spittle, although the British are probably saying ass kisser now because they get our movies and TV shows. But anyway, you know, I was accused of all sorts of things and I, I'm just trying to do my, my thing. I don't, I don't care about the position and all that, but you know, that's the way it was perceived. So I would just say as a roundabout sort of uh, tie up this whole mess here that I've made in this video is act normal. You know, that, that's, that's the byword, I would say. It's just act normal. You know, it's, it's, uh, if you've ever been high and, and you have to go into a restaurant or somebody and your friends go, hey, act normal, act normal. And then you go, oh, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll try to act normal. And you go, <laughs> you know, but it's not quite that bad. But you, you, can, you can find a way to act normal because you know how to act normal. So that's the thing. Don't, don't try to teach anybody. I mean, that's, that's a 
losing game right there. Don't don't even try. That would be my advice. Just maybe listen for hints that somebody wants to go there and then then see if they really want to go there. It's it's a bit like se seduction in a way. I'm, I'm sorry to use these weird metaphors, but it kind of feels like a bit of the same thing where you're trying to see, do they really want to have this experience and go there? And, and do they want to have that experience with me? You know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a similar situation. And if it doesn't feel right, you know, no means no, and learn to, to listen for the signals that somebody's saying they're not ready for this, and back off, and just go, hey, what about the Browns, or I don't know, anyway, it's Cleveland sports team, the Browns, I think they're football, anyway, whatever, that's my advice. I don't know uh, what else to tell you, but I can tell you that uh, I am supported by your Patreon and PayPal donations. That didn't change as far as, uh, as any sort of experiences I've had in Zen. Still got to make the money. And uh, you guys are really helping me do that and helping me live the, the life that, uh, that I live, uh, such as it is. And thank you very much. See you later. Bye.